Inspired by the Curiosity rover, think science on Earth is too mainstream? Want to put something impressive on your university application? Well, you clicked on the right video. Today, I'm at the Mars Yard run by Airbus in Stevenage to learn how you can send your own rover to the Red Planet. By deciding to send a rover to Mars, you join an exclusive club. Only seven missions have been attempted. However, you wouldn't be alone. The ExoMars mission is a current collaboration between the European Space Agency and Roscosmos. I asked the engineers at Airbus who are designing and building the rover what systems you would need in your rover. You need to know what the mission is. That's the primary driver. So the mission is to find life. We need to look underground to find life because the surface of Mars is inhospitable, so you need a drill. The mechanical design of your rover it has to be able to survive launch and landing, and then actually have the physical structure where that everything is stored into that will then be able to be driven across the surface of Mars. Then you need to know where to drill, how do you get to those sites, so you need to be able to drive it. In order to drive it, you need to have a computer to tell it where to go, you need to be able to communicate with Earth, so you need a communication system. Um, all of this stuff needs power, so you need to decide on a power system as well. But you can't just use any materials in the construction of your systems. There are strict requirements you must adhere to. If you were to sort of start from scratch with a rover, you have to think about, I've got to get this off the surface of the planet, first and foremost. So everything has to be strong, but light. One of the key constraints on us is that we can't take organic material to Mars, and that means most plastics, rubbers, um, oils are out. So the rover's pretty much entirely composed of carbon fibre, titanium, steel and aluminium. Once you've assembled all the materials on screen, you're ready to start. It's recommended that you watch all the steps of the process before beginning your project. Step 1. This is an Allen key. Insert cable X32 into female port 13 Kato. As in step 537, if the component moves too much, then this is your friend. Alternatively, if it's not moving enough, this. And you finished your rover. However, before starting the project, make sure you have enough funds secured to finish it. How much do you need? So the current spend for the ExoMars mission, which includes a satellite, which is currently orbiting Mars, the lander, paying engineers wages for the last decade, uh, four prototype rovers, the facility, the launcher, the lander. This has all currently come to about 1.3 billion euros. Ah, so this isn't really affordable, is it? <laughs> no. Okay, look, you click this video full well knowing that building your own Mars rover and sending it to Mars wasn't going to happen. The point of this video is that I went and had a look at the European ExoMars rover, which was being built by Airbus at the Mars Yard, and in the process of filming that joke intro and interviewing the engineers, there were three really interesting bits of science which emerged about how the rover's designed and the science that it does on Mars. So I wanted to talk about them. First up is the autonomous driving system on the rover. It really isn't practical to design a rover which you control remotely from Earth because of how far away Mars is and the fact that there's a signal delay. So any information we send to Mars travels there at the speed of light, which may be very fast, but Mars is very, very far away. So when Mars is at the furthest point from Earth, it takes 20 minutes for a signal from Earth to reach there. So it's a 40 minute round trip delay if you want to send an instruction to your rover and then for you to see the response of the rover. For example, moving forwards and seeing where you are. So to get around this, the engineers designed the rover to drive itself. The rover has complete autonomy. If we want to drive it, we'd just give it a location on the map and we'd say drive to this location. And that can be up to 80 metres away. That's as far as it can travel in one day. The autonomous navigation starts with the two cameras at the top of the mast, the navigation cameras. They see in 3D in much the same way we do. Um, our brains are very, very good at combining images together to produce the 3D picture of what's in front of us. We have taught our rover to do the same thing, to combine the two images together uh, using a technique called disparity um, to look for common features among amongst the two images. That allows us to produce a 3D picture of what's in front of the rover. So we just give it a location on a map. It creates um, a set of coordinates with the rover at the centre, and we say drive to this coordinate. Um, so it would scan the area, identify the location of that target, and it would drive itself there, avoiding any dangerous obstacles. So it's not either safe or even efficient to drive the rover by remote control from the Earth. And so we want the rover to be deciding what's safe and what's not, to making as much of the decisions on board as possible. Though, having said that, they did allow me to drive one of the earlier prototypes of the rover via remote control, which is done via a gamepad, and it wasn't exactly speedy. <gasps> 
Interesting bit of science number two, the hardware limitations. I mentioned earlier that you're really limited in the materials you're allowed to put in a rover, so no organic compounds like plastics in case you contaminate the surface and skew the scientific experiments. You also have to use stuff that's light and strong, obviously. But more than that, when designing the computer that you're putting in the rover, you're not actually allowed to use the most recent hardware, like processors. And when I asked the engineer, Paul, why this was, he said it's because the hardware has to be space qualified. The processor's clocked at something like uh, 71 megahertz, which is about 10 years behind the best processors these days. But the reason for that is because it has to be space qualified, and that process does take a long time. In particular, it has to be able to withstand the radiation environment, both on the way to Mars and on the surface of Mars, because energetic particles and radiation can cause real, real problems inside a computer and cause, for example, ones to become zeros and zeros to become ones. So something that made sense is suddenly gibberish. So the rover is driving itself and doing potentially paradigm shifting science on another planet using a processor that was just about good enough to run Fallout 3. And lastly, the third interesting bit of science, the weather on Mars. So this one may have been particularly interesting to me because I'm an atmospheric scientist, but obviously when you're sending a rover somewhere, you have to bear in mind where you're sending it. So for example, on Mars, the gravity is a third the strength that it is on Earth. So you may have thought that the rover in all these shots looks quite spindly and light, and that's because it only has a third the mass of the rover that's gonna go to Mars, and that's to simulate simulate the one-third gravity. And that's done to more accurately simulate the strain that the wheels are going to be under on the terrain so they can get a better idea of how it's going to drive. But another Mars-specific thing is the weather on Mars. And that weather has determined a lot of how the mission is going to operate. So Mars, it does still have seasons and it does change, but it's, it doesn't have as complicated a weather system as we have here. Um, the main concern we have on Mars is dust storms. Mars has a global dust storm season which lasts for about half of the year and it's just it's like a whiteout but it's orange and that's a problem for us for two reasons. First of all you're getting this nice abrasion happening um, as your rover kind of gets sandblasted, uh, sand's getting into all your moving parts and keyly and most importantly is that you have the sun blocked out. So if you're powered by solar power which we are and you have a nice layer of orange dust lying across your solar rays um, and blocking out the sun because it's up in, the, up in the air, you then can't generate any power. So the way we get around it is by having our mission for the other half of the year. So rather than over-design the rover and give it a bunch of mechanical parts that could clear dust off the solar panels, the engineers just said, let's keep it simple and the dust storms just determine the length of the mission. I should point out that a bit of science that I haven't talked about in this video is the mission that the rover is doing, which is to find past or present life on Mars by drilling below the surface. And the reason that I haven't talked about that is because my friend Ines, who has just finished her PhD, she's just submitted her PhD at the University of Oxford, she's done a video on exactly that. She was on the trip with me and so she's done a video on the biological side of the mission. So if you're interested in that, go check her out because she knows what she's talking about. Thank you to Airbus for inviting me to the Mars Yard and thank you to the Airbus engineers who were lovely hosts, great interviewees, and I found the mission absolutely fascinating. So if you did too, then there's links in the description to the science that they're doing and everything about the mission. And just trust me, it's much cheaper and easier to let the experts do this than to build the rover yourself. Check out Anace's video if you're interested in the biological side of the mission. That's all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, pop it a like and I'll see you in the next one.